Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 852 of the Juice Box Podcast. Tim is a type 1. He's been living with type 1 diabetes for quite some time. He's an adult. This is his story. I enjoyed it. I think you will too. I'm almost down to just not doing these opens for you. I don't know what to say about this episode. It's great. Really great conversation with Tim. You know what I mean? He has type 1 diabetes. He's an adult. I don't know what else to tell you. I will tell you that Nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Please always consult a physician before you make any changes to your healthcare plan or become bold with insulin. Are you a type 1 like Tim, or are you the caregiver of someone with type 1? If you are, and you're a U.S. resident, you are eligible to fill out the T1D Exchange Survey. This takes about 10 minutes and helps people with type 1 diabetes. And how does it help? It helps because you're supporting type 1 research. t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. Never has it been so easy to be so helpful. You know, uh, don't let my open make you feel weirdly about this episode. It's so good. I just don't know how to explain an hour and 20 minutes of talking in two seconds, you know? This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter, contournext.com forward slash juice box. Today I saw someone online, they were so confused about why their meter was so far off from their CGM, and I looked at the meter in the photo, I had never heard of it before in my life. And so I said, how do you even know that meter is accurate? You gotta get an accurate meter, contournext.com forward slash juice box. You wanna know something else? This show is sponsored today by the glucagon that my daughter carries, Gvoke Hypopen. Find out more at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. My name is Tim. I am a type 1 diabetic, and uh, I have been for about 22 years. How old does that make you? So I'm 39. Okay. I was diagnosed uh, April 18th. 2000. Mm -hmm. And um, I was 17 years old when I was diagnosed. I was going to say, are you getting ready to graduate from high school? I was a uh, spring of my junior year. Wow. Okay. So um, like a little bit of the diagnosis story. It was, um, I was, um, and I still am a classical musician. I play the French horn and uh, I was preparing for college auditions because I was going to major in music. I had, um, uh, I grew up in Seattle mm -hmm. and my mom and I were going to Florida to uh, take lessons with a couple of different French horn teachers uh, at Florida state. And um, I believe a uh, university of South Florida, both had really good teachers there at the time. And uh, so we flew to Florida to kind of get lessons with those teachers and tour the schools and stuff like that. And she, that's when she noticed, because we were at close quarters that I was, really skinny and drinking water mm -hmm. all the time and waking up middle of the night, cotton mouth, drinking like, you know, five glasses of water and going back to sleep, right. um, peeing constantly, all that stuff. Um, it's kind of funny because I still, uh, kind of joke that I blame Florida for my diabetes. So I blame them for some things as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and this was before, um, was it? Yeah. 2000. Oh, yeah, it was before the the Bush Gore election, <laughs> but you know. <laughs> it's him getting my reference. Okay, so um French horn. You do you yeah. do that for a living? So uh I'm a music teacher, okay. but I freelance uh as much as I can. Um my my undergrad degree was in music performance. Um and uh, a lot of my friends from my undergrad degree are like making it big time, like playing on Hollywood films and stuff. No um, and uh, I just play in local orchestras, brass quintets, woodwind quintets, horn quartets, mm. um, kind of wherever. And I don't need, since I'm, I'm a full-time music teacher at a public school, uh, I don't need to freelance to make a living. I just enjoy it. Okay. That's excellent. And you probably named your episode 
this blows depending on what else happens <laughs> for the next hour. So we'll, we'll see. Hey, the yeah. French horn makes me think of trying to force a tiny bit of air or a lot of air through a tiny passage. But I yeah, that's a lot like that. Is it? Is, is it? It's um, yeah. Or, and it's all about the air. Yeah. No kidding. How do you become <laughs> interested in that? Well, I, um, I, I was in band. Well, start off. My older sister was in band and my older brother was in orchestra. Um, and so I always knew I wanted to play an instrument. I just wanted to, um, took piano lessons at a young age for a couple of years, then started playing the trumpet. And then, um, my, um, my brother's best friend had been a French horn player. I remember when their band toured our elementary school and I saw him in the horn section, holding up his horn when they were going through teaching the instruments. And I was like, Oh, he's cool. And I, when the band director said, Oh, we need to switch some people to horn. You won't have to rent a trumpet anymore. We'll provide a horn for you. Uh, that was enough to convince my mom. And uh, <laughs> little did she know how much she'd be paying for music lessons. <laughs> Once I started taking private lessons and practicing a lot. So I remember that moment in, in school when they introduced you to all the, the instruments and I wanted to play the cello so badly. And by the time, like I just got up in line the cellos were gone and the guy's like, you should try a saxophone. And uh, I did not like <laughs> not that. the same. Yeah. Yeah. I did not like that. and did not do it very long. Um, I think honestly carrying it back and forth in my house a couple of times is what did me in, but <laughs> I'm sure I wouldn't have enjoyed it. Maybe I would have liked the cello enough. I would have tried it. I'm not certain, but yeah, I, I, I got eliminated from my choice uh, just because there weren't enough interest. And it sounds too like your, your school did something similar. They're like, hey, we need a French horn. It's free. Come on, take it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. very motivating. <laughs> that's wonderful. Well, that that's uh, that's really interesting. So you do it now as a um, as a as a profession. You teach other children. You teach children how to how to play music. Yeah. So I, um, I went to let's see. I went to school for music performance at um, in Southern California. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Seattle and ended up going to USC. Um, and, um, speaking of Hollywood, like all my teachers were like Hollywood guys, hmm. just cool. Um, and the, um, when I finished my undergrad, I wasn't sure if I wanted to be a music teacher. I thought I might be good at it and it might be something I'd want to do, but I wasn't quite sure. And, uh, I ended up taking a year off. I actually played in Mexico for a little while and, uh, that's, also kind of interesting as a type one diabetic mm -hmm. taking all taking all your Medtronic pump gear down to Mexico um, and uh, spent like four or five months down in Mexico. And then after I finished kind of playing down there, I ended up starting a master's in education and uh, got hired in uh, I'm in Orange County. Okay. Um, and I got hired down here in the middle of my student teaching. Did you play? Spent classical music in mexico or did you play more cultural yeah. stuff yeah no it was uh classical music and the occasional mexican pop concert yeah oh, that sounds like fun and and so it was um it was a really fun experience i was a professional orchestra experience so we do uh you'd rehearse monday through thursday nine to noon you have a concert thursday night you have two days off another concert sunday afternoon new music the next monday mm. And did that September through December and then came back for a, uh, like a month and a half in January, February. I bet and you that, that makes that you nimble, was, huh? Like it really teaches you how to, how to learn and relearn. Yeah. It, it's, it also is you spend your entire undergrad as a music, as a musician, kind of putting the orchestra life on a pedestal and then you got to taste it. <laughs> and granted, it's not the same experience as someone who plays in the Los Angeles Philharmonic, but, um, it still i was like you know what this was great but i don't feel like i have to do this to be happy mm -hmm. uh like i thought i maybe did and it kind of gave me permission to pursue life as being a music teacher and feel feel content with that and not like i was like giving up on my dreams you know That's excellent yeah did you ever get to play in the marching band at usc uh i i was very non-marching band oriented all through um uh, high school and uh and i actually did not play in the marching band at sc and i always get asked that question well it's just an iconic image in my mind right oh yeah they're a yeah. great band yeah 
yeah, they are a fantastic band. And uh, I, my roommate played in their band and um, had a great experience. I had a lot of friends that played in the band. I was, I've always been an orchestra and maybe wind ensemble, but even that's like, <laughs> I prefer orchestras. Mm -hmm. All right, let's ask the real question here, Tim, before we move on. Can you get girls playing the French horn? No. <laughs> no, I, I shouldn't say that. That's not true. But I did not meet my wife playing the French horn. So, okay, fine. I'll just say it. I don't know. You said no pretty no. quick. To... <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, actually, I'll, going back. So when I was in middle school, I started playing the horn in sixth grade. And um, I started playing the guitar in seventh grade. Mm -hmm. Largely because, number one, they wouldn't let French horns play in the jazz band. And number two, I knew that French horn wasn't going to get any girls. Did the guitar work? Vaguely. <laughs> it's a lot more about confidence than it is about um, what instrument you play. And that's, you know, oh. I was never confident. I think that sometimes, <laughs> I think even um, visually confident people, it doesn't seem to mean as much about how they look even. Con confidence, yeah. confidence plays a big part. Um, anyway, so do, are you forcing any of your children to play an instrument or do they seem interested? Well, I am, I'm always a fan of exposing them to lots of stuff and seeing where their passion lies. And if it's playing an instrument, that's fine. And if it's uh, something else in the arts, that's fine too. Mm -hmm. uh, but you better believe there'll be lots of arts, right? So <laughs> now my daughter's at an Encanto summer camp right now. Oh, wow. Well, that's really cool. I, I, yeah, she's, I still, she's six, so she's the right age for that. Without any hesitation, if you ask me the best concert I've ever been to. Yo-Yo Ma playing Bach cello suites. That was it. It's the best thing I've oh, ever yeah. seen live. I played with uh, with Yo-Yo Ma in college, and it was a fantastic experience. No kidding. Yeah, we went. Re was, re Go ahead. I'm sorry. He's every bit as great as his reputation proceeds, and he's also every bit as humble and kind. It seemed obvious. He just he. Uh, we were at the Washington Cathedral, and it's a very small stage. Uh, we drove all the way to Washington from New Jersey to see it, and I think we were about eight rows from the side of the stage, and he just came out, sat down, spoke for 30 seconds, played, got to the end of the suite, stopped, stood up, spoke for 30 seconds, sat back down, played again, just rolled right through them. It was. It Did was, he roll through all six? Yeah, it was something else. Oh, gosh, that's amazing. Yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen live. So, and it, and it sounded it sounded better than I, I imagined it was going to. It was, uh, we played, it was right after his Ennio Morricone um, sure. album came out mm -hmm. and we did a bunch of music from, it was like like um, like the Mission and uh, Good, the Bad and the Ugly and stuff like that that we played with him. Wow, that sounds fun. Okay, so you get diabetes when you're 17. Do you have any brothers or sisters? Does anybody else in your family have type one? So no one has type one. Um, grandmother had type two um but autoimmune stuff was pretty rampant in my family so um my grandmother died of scleroderma and she had been a smoker her whole life and so scleroderma like turns her tissue hard mm -hmm. um a weird autoimmune thing where it turns her tissue like really hard and um it hers affected her lungs oh and so um that's what took my grandmother on my mom's side. My mom has, uh, it's actually gone into remission, but dermatomyositis, um, when she was in like, when she was young, like probably about younger than where, how old I am now. So I think she was in her twenties or early thirties when she had dermatomyositis. And, um, that ended up going into remission. That's also autoimmune. Um, everyone seems to, well, no, not my, Oldest brother, my mom, and my sister all have thyroid problems. I have Hashimoto's also. Mm -hmm. I was diagnosed with that, I think, like 2010 or so. So it was about 10 years after my type 1 diagnosis. And um, then uh, my daughter just diagnosed this month with celiac. Okay. And you have two kids? Yeah. My son is 19 months. And uh, so far everything's a-okay okay. we're planning on we did right when we were going through all this blood work for my daughter we did trial net mm -hmm. and she was negative for type 1 auto antibodies and so hooray yeah, that's it was exciting. one small bit of one small bit of of um 
positivity in the midst of other difficult medical diagnoses. But uh, when my son turns two, I'm planning on doing trial net with him as well, just to see. Okay. It's funny because um, I'm looking up the, you know, when, when, when people talk, I Google and uh, a lot of the word rare, fewer than 2000 or 200,000 cases a year pop up when you're talking. Um, this scleroderma or derma could, it could impact anywhere, but it, it specifically impacted your grandmother's lungs. Yeah. Yeah. She had been a lifelong smoker. Oh, okay. So maybe the weakening of, from the smoking might've drawn it to that yeah. area. Is that what I'm thinking? Or made, yeah. made that area more I, susceptible perhaps. When you have diabetes and use insulin, low blood sugar can happen when you don't expect it. Gvoke Hypopen is a ready to use glucagon option that can treat very low blood sugar in adults and kids with diabetes ages two and above. Find out more. Go to gvoglucagon.com forward slash juice box. Gvoke shouldn't be used in patients with theochromocytoma or insulinoma. Visit gvoglucagon.com slash risk. At some point on your diabetes journey, a person gave you a blood glucose meter. Did they say to you, hey, this is a great blood glucose meter. It's one of the most accurate ones that they ever made. No, no, no one said that. Did they say, by the way, there are other blood glucose meters. You might want to look into it. I'm just going to give you this one because I have it here in the drawer. Nope, they didn't say that either. They just gave it to you and you thought, well, this must be my blood glucose meter because the doctor gave it to me. But there are many meters and they're not all made equally. You deserve an accurate, well-made, and easy-to-use blood glucose meter. You deserve the Contour Next One. The Contour Next One is my favorite blood glucose meter. I know that's a strange thing to say, but we've used a number of them over the years, and this one is my favorite. Why? Bright light for use at night. The screen, super easy to read. It's manageable, and by that I mean it's a good size. It's not too big, it's not too small. And I love the way it fits in my hand. It's sort of um, because of the shape, which you'll see at contournext.com forward slash juice box. Almost feels like you're holding a, like a pen in your hand. I don't know how to put it exactly. You'll see when you get to the website. But the Contour Next One blood glucose meter is incredibly accurate. But you might be worried, Scott, all this accuracy. Uh, is it more expensive? Am I going to be paying a bunch more money? Uh, I don't think so. Actually, if you go to contournext.com forward slash juice box, you can actually buy it right now at a number of online venues, Walmart, Amazon, Walgreens, CVS, the uh, list goes on and on, Target, Rite Aid. And so when you get to my link, check it out because you might be able to save time and money buying Contour Next products from the convenience of your home. What am I saying? Well, I'm saying that it's possible that this meter and the test strips could be cheaper in cash then you're paying right now through your insurance company for an inferior product. How crazy is that? You owe it to yourself to be using the best equipment that you can. And there's no reason not to check out the Contour Next One blood glucose meter. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. Yeah, I think so. And then, ooh, derma, what is it? Dermatomyositis. Dermatomyositis. Okay. Dermatomyositis. An infl inflammatory disease marked by muscle weakness and a skin rash. How long did it impact your mom? Um, Gosh, it was a few years, I think. And it was it was the point, she said that her muscles were affected where she couldn't even raise her arms above her head. Um, and yeah, it, I know it was really difficult and then it went into remission. Just so stopped. yeah, like she's not affected by it right now. So, and, and she's in her sixties now, I'm guessing by your age. Uh, or, she's or in her seventies. Seventies. Okay. Yeah. I my, my, um, I'm the youngest of four and my oldest is 11 years older than me. My oldest brother. I so okay. there's a bit, big, bit of a spread between us. Well, there might've been a gap in there where your mom wasn't up for, uh, making a baby too, if she wasn't yeah. feeling well, right? And it was, um, 
She had the oldest two, and then there was a big gap, and then she had my brother and me. How did your Hashimoto's present? Um, I didn't recall necessarily having all kinds of weird symptoms, but I went into my endocrinologist and my endocrinologists always kind of, as a matter of course, would feel my thyroid. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I went in this time and he felt my thyroid and he says, Oh yeah, you have a goiter. You have Hashimoto's. I'm going to send you in for an ultrasound to confirm. And then, um, so they did an ultrasound on my neck and, and then, um, started me on labothyroxine. Yeah. Uh, just take that or do you take a T3 supplement as well? Oh, so that's, I actually do take a th T3 supplement as well now, mm -hmm. um, which kind of goes back to, uh, just kind of recently, it was about probably a year and a half ago. It was right after my son was born. Um, I started having these really weird symptoms. And, um, it was, it was like gastroparesis symptoms. And at the time I didn't know what gastroparesis was. Um, but I had just, I had, um, what was the book that I looked at? It was, it was the Bernstein book, mm -hmm. um, which I'm not a pr big proponent of, but I was looking through and I remember reading something about gastroparesis. So I went back and looked at the Bernstein book and he had this whole thing talking about the symptoms of gastroparesis. And I was like, that is what I'm experiencing. It was like, I would eat, I would uh, only be able to eat a little bit and I'd feel full and nauseated for like four or five hours. Okay. Um, and then I was, um, so I, um, I was like, this sounds like gastroparesis. I went to my primary care doctor. I um, said, I, I feel like I'm showing these symptoms. I said, okay, we'll refer you to a GI. Um, the GI doctor ordered like the, the, it's like the barium drink test where mm -hmm. you like drink a barium milkshake and then they like take pictures of your stomach, but it wasn't really conclusive for gastroparesis. Meanwhile, I saw my endocrinologist. We did blood work. My thyroid was at like 12 oh and God. this was like a year and a half ago. My thyroid's always been well controlled, but my thyroid went way out of whack. Like, and I don't know why it went way out of whack, but we increased my thyroid medication like by, two increments right up to like 150 i was i think i was at like maybe 112 he moved me up to like 150 and then um that was too far and then we ended up pulling it back to like 137 and then i still was having weird symptoms and um oh i believe that like the last time that you and i like messaged each other it was like over uh, iron supplements mm -hmm. um because uh i messaged you about like what iron supplements because i know you talked about your low iron issues my iron was at like 11 oh yeah, that's low. That make you feel yeah. like you're gonna fall right over mm -hmm. on top of, and then you can misconstrue that with thyroid symptoms too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But my um, my a after the doctor fixed my thyroid dose, that gastroparesis symptoms resolved within a month. Yeah, because it wasn't gastroparesis. It's that it was yeah thyroid induced dismotility. Yeah. Hey, um, what was I going to say about that? Were you very stressed about the baby at that time or anything like that? I don't know if I was particularly stressed about the baby. Or, or anything? It, like, you know, something that could, um, had you had a virus, an illness, something that could kind of throw you into flux for a while? Yeah, I don't I don't think so. I mean, this is in the, the heart of the um, COVID stuff, but right. I we, we never got COVID. So, yeah. and we were always pretty careful. Is there I actually, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I changed when, when my, my, my school, like, um, when everything closed down, like in uh, spring of 2020, my district opened up a virtual school and I actually transferred to it just because I, it was still so early and I just didn't want to be back in person. Mm -hmm. Um, like just, you know, every, they all, they're saying, you know, if you have type one and you're well controlled, it's not going to give you necessarily a worse outcome, but I was like, I don't want to mess with this. So, <laughs> um, so I went to a virtual school and I've actually stayed there. So now I teach, I don't teach band choir anymore. I teach like guitar over zoom and, um, music appreciation and songwriting and things like that. So you're teaching strictly over zoom still. Yeah. 
I am. You can teach the guitar? I guess you can, right? You could, I mean, I saw Metallica teaching people how to play riffs the other day in some paid service. So I assume it's the same yeah. idea, right? You know, it works pretty well. You use a lot, a lot of other things like, um, you have to use other, like, they, they have to quick, take quick little snapshots of their own playing, like after every lesson. So you ask them to make like a flip grid, which is like a short little video or something like that to show that they're practicing the skill you're working on because they're all muted. So there's no way that you can like really know how they're doing unless you're doing those other things. But yeah, we can, we can do it over. Oh, Zoom. oh so it's a um, large class. Like under 15 kids, but yeah. Well, I mean, if you're, if it's music, any, anyone over one is large because you can't, so there's no audio. So are you, are you studying their, their finger work and things like that? I'll look at their finger work. And then I will have them, I will show them a technique. I'll get them time to practice it. Um, maybe like have them work on a chord. It's like a beginning guitar class. So it's like um, like basic chords and basic note reading stuff. And um, then, yeah, they'll make a little video of whatever the skill is, like of them playing a C chord or a G chord or whatever. Mm -hmm. How long do you let somebody go before you tell them they're not good at it? Oh, I don't, I don't tell people they're not good at it. Never. Are you kidding me? Just keep no. playing. Okay. Like, I mean, people know if they're not good, but I, I will tell them if they have a playing test, I'll, <laughs> I'll give them accurate <laughs> score. But. but you never pull someone aside and go, listen, you're wasting your time. <laughs> this is never going to come together for you. It, it's no, you don't, not, not with yeah. the phase that I would be. I mean, if I was like a college professor and like someone was trying to make it as, for a living, right. like, then, uh, sorry, buddy, you don't have what it takes, gotcha. but um not but no not like not for you know i i've only had i've been teaching music for 15 or 16 years and i've only had one or two kids go professional um and that's fine <laughs> well, I mean, so that would um, be the expectation right yeah well the expectation is for teaching music for kids is that they're going to hopefully learn to enjoy music so. right yeah no i imagine does that work or or do you know what i mean like do you see it translate into their lives do they are they listening to music that you're surprised by, or do they appreciate things that you wouldn't expect for their age when they're, when they're playing? I think so. Not all the time, but I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and then you can see kids. I remember having kids where like, um, I had a kid who didn't really even want to be in band. Uh, he wanted to be an ASB, but ASB was full. And then I got him started and, uh, on, he was on trumpet and I switched him to French horn and, then he like went on to major in music. Like he really took off. Like, so like you have kids that don't know they love it and then you teach them some stuff and then they take off. Wow. That's really rewarding. What is ASB? I'm sorry. Oh, it's like, um, student leadership. Oh, okay. I thought it was like a porn genre or something. I was like, I don't know what that is <laughs> uh, at all. It's <laughs> like, geez, of course I know it's these, not that these kids are doing stuff. I don't even know about anymore. Um, yeah. Okay. So, all right. So, okay. Wait a minute. I want to go back to the Hashimoto. So Hashimoto's presented the way it did. And you took care of it, that, and but you added T three. What, what? Yeah, so I was still having weird energy things, and I just my, my thing I really like about my endoc my current endocrinologist, um, not the same one that diagnosed me with the Hashimoto's, but um, he, I didn't have a Dexcom before I saw him. I didn't get Omnipod before I saw him. He's been always very uh upfront about current tech mm -hmm. and advocating for it so um i i currently i currently loop um and i i use uh, omnipod and dexcom okay and um he's been supportive all along he hasn't been like hey you should loop i that's all been me but i said you know i i want to do this and he's like do you understand how the settings work i'm like yes and he goes okay let me know if you have questions, nice. you know? So, um, and then he's always, if I'm like, Hey, I want to try, um, you and Jeff, cause the ASP isn't covered around on my plan. Um, we tried it. I actually had the same experience as your daughter, um, burns, 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 burns and pods all fail, but like a day and a half in. Okay. Um, so I, I went back to Novel Novolog. Her pods Novolog. lasted. She just, so Fiasp, she could. She could take the fiasp, but it made her very sore at her site. Yeah, I I can take it via syringe. I keep a vial of it around for if I'm like stuck high. Mm -hmm. Um, but because it works, 
and it works fast by syringe and it doesn't burn by syringe, but in the pump it burned. And then I would get inflamed. My site would get inflamed and it would fail by the end of the second day. Yeah. Always. That's interesting. Sometimes uh, earlier. We kept it around too. We, we use it with a syringe once in a while too. I'm sort of like, you know what, let's stop messing with this and just, you know, crush this real quickly. The loom Jev, she came to me within hours and said, I'm taking this pump off right now. Yeah. It burned. So, yeah. That, that she mm -hmm. didn't, she didn't uh, jive with very well. I wish it hadn't, but cause I liked how fast it worked. Oh, yeah. I, I, I really enjoyed Fiasp. It made a, it made an actual uh, difference in her, in her blood sugars. And that's saying something. And it created a lot more, um, uh, a, a lot fewer choppy lines, kept things more smooth. Um, just they, and, you know, and kept you from having to pre bolus as, as far out. It was, it was very nice. Mm -hmm. and, and had it not stung her, she would be definitely using it right now. I'm sure it's working for plenty of people. It just sadly didn't work out for her. Actually, I wanted to tell you, um, that before T3 for Arden, um, so Arden takes Cytomil as her T3. My son takes okay. armor. Mine's like a Cytomel generic. Okay. My, my son yeah. takes armor thyroid as his T3. And um, for him, it's just, a, it's a good balance for him. His energy's good. His muscle tone, like everything, it just works for him. And Addy's a terrific endocrinologist, though, especially for thyroid. And, uh, but Arden, so Arden tried armor because Cole was using armor. Didn't work for her. So Addy moved her to Cytomil and boom, she's good again. Without yeah. Cytomil. Uh, here's the example. It, you know, you know, in the yearbook, since you're a teacher, you can buy like an ad for your kid. Basically, uh -huh. it basically just says like, congratulations, you graduated. And the school makes some money off it. You throw a picture and you write something. That's it. We took one lovely photo of Arden and surrounded it by, I think, eight or nine photos of her just slumped over sleeping in our house in the strangest places, like face down on a countertop or in the fetal position, but up on her knees and her head on the floor or under a blanket or under a jacket. We had so many photos of her That's just asleep in the strange. Both sad place. and funny. <laughs> yes, exactly. So uh, I forget exactly what it says, but it says something like, you know, Arden, we're very proud, whatever you would say. And at the end, it says, if you see our daughter sleeping at college, please put a blanket over her. And, uh, <laughs> but, you know, um, she just, I mean, she'd come home from school and we had like a bar stool on, you know, a cold piece of stone and she would just lay down face down on it and go to sleep. Mm. And it's, and then you give her that T3 and I'm telling you in mere days, it's over. It's just gone. What kind of a, a percentage of, cause the way my do, endo explained it is the, the T3 is five times stronger than T4. So like I was taking like 137 of T4 and he reduced it to 112, but they gave you five micrograms of T3. I think so. Arden's, I think our Cytomel is five micrograms. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. That same amount. Yeah. So yeah. I, he reduced, he reduced my, yeah, he reduced my T4, which um, is a uh, Lavoxel, mm -hmm. uh, which the, it's the one that's actually shaped like a thyroid. Yeah. Uh, and um, he's, he's like, yeah, you, we've talked about how you talked about how generics thyroids pills like to be careful about. Right. And so my doctor is like that yeah, Lavoxel is the generic I prescribe because I like it. It's consistent. If it and works. That one's yeah. been good. My, both yeah. of my kids take Tyrosin as their T4, which is a, um, just a pure form of it. It's in a cap, mm -hmm. uh, cap. What would you call that? It's not a tablet. Capsule? It's not a capsule. Cap? It's a gel cap. Thank you. I don't know why mm -hmm. that word escaped me. Uh, one of them is at 0.7 and one of them is at 0.85. I, I'm not sure which is which at this point, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, mm -hmm. but anyway, that's, so there's a ton of this in your family. You, you know, your, your, do you say your daughter has celiac? Yeah. Just diagnosed. We're really fresh. Okay. Uh, anybody else in the family? How did you figure out her celiac? So she's very small. Um, she was like probably like 10th percentile when she was little, like very little. And then she's kind of slowly creeping down. She was at fifth percentile when she turned five and the doctor's like, okay, we're watching this closely now. Fifth percentile is a big deal. If she gets any lower than that, we need to really look at what's going on. Yeah. And then, uh, at when she was five, we did a full panel of blood work and a bone x-ray uh, on her wrist to see her bone age. And, um, the, her, her, um, 
celiac indicator level, I guess the, it's the level of um, auto antibodies against against gluten in the bloodstream was like right at the borderline, like border is like 20 and she was at like 21. Okay. And so they're like, okay, well, that's a little concerning. Let's watch it for a year and see what happens. Age six, we did the same test. She was out over 80, like 86. Mm. So um, they're like, okay, that's conclusive for celiac. So we'll refer you to the GI. She just did the endoscopy, like the beginning of this month. And then that came back conclusive. But she's not um, symptomatic other than being small and occasionally complaining about tummy aches, but not chronically. But they're going to switch her diet? Yeah, we've already switched her diet. Okay. Yeah. So as soon as she came back with the um, the positive endoscopy, then we switched her diet. Okay. We, so we've already kind of transitioned our kitchen off of gluten. How long has it been? It's um, beginning of this month. Oh, very recent. So you, it, yeah. it's too soon to even ask if you've seen any difference. Yeah, it's too soon. Okay. But right now we're just getting used to it and learning how to eat at restaurants and things like that. Right. Did the whole family switch? Um. Our household, but like, like our, like our kitchen, um, just because we don't want her to get cross contaminated. Mm-hmm. But it's important that my son continue to eat gluten. That's what our GI doctor said. Because if we to take it out of his diet, he could develop an actual allergy to it when oh, no, exposed too. to it. Oh, so he said that it's actually important that he continues to get it. So we're trying to figure out how to do that. <laughs> But we'll, we'll figure it out. Like, you know, if we go to a restaurant or something like that, like he can have the bread and she can't, you right. know, so. um, And so we're trying to keep it in that way. Gotcha. Uh, have you noticed any improvement for yourself stopping gluten? Sometimes people stop it and they're like, nothing changed, even if they don't have a problem with it. And sometimes people feel like it was a good thing to do. I haven't noticed yet. Yeah. I think you would if you were going to. Mm-hmm. Um, interesting. Your wife, uh, I'm assuming, is just waiting for a moment when the three of you turn your back so she can run away. Is she, is she probably like, oh, my God, what's happening? Does she have any issues on her side? No, not really. You didn't attract an she, autoimmune she, girl? One, no. What, what, with, um, with our son, um, actually, I'm blinking if it was my son, our son or our daughter. It was with our son. She had gestational diabetes okay wait no it was with it's not funny you don't know i yeah why why am i blinking on whether it, which which kid it was did it seem my, like a with big my deal daughter happened, or did it not seem like a big deal it wasn't a huge deal it's probably she the was second kind of just though. eating more low carb and yeah. managed it that way that's a great look into what life does to you right there how old is how old is your oldest Six. Six. So in the last six years, your wife's had gestational diabetes, and you're not sure with which pregnancy. (laughs) That Hmm. sounds terrible. No, no, no. He's going to listen to this and laugh at me. (laughs) Laugh at you or not talk to you for three days, one or the other. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Well, the thing is, with with my daughter, she had, um, she ended up having, um, sorry, my brain just went foggy all of a sudden. Your blood sugar okay? Do you want to take a look at your CGM? (laughs) Uh, no, I, I actually I, I went high. Why did I go high? I think I'm I think I'm stressed out talking to you. Scott. You're excited. That's all, Tim. I'm a, basically yeah. a celebrity. So. I got like six point six units of insulin on board, and I'm rising. No kidding. Just, yeah. Just and at the beginning, you said I'm not nervous. This is fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's not true. Go figure. Yeah. Listen, it, it's uh, it can be uh, can be scary talking to a person with as big of a, a public profile as I have. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're, you're kind of a big deal. Silly. You have all leather bound books. <laughs> we your, your apartment smells like rich mahogany <laughs> that's not what's happening at all but <laughs> i mean you and i have texted about like iron supplements i don't imagine you would have been nervous to talk to me but that's really interesting um yeah, that's funny do you want to get a drink of water or anything you okay no i'm good okay um okay so your wife may or may not have had gestational diabetes and other things happening but god knows what they were uh during her pregnancy <laughs> It's such a long time ago. Who cares, really? My my daughter was born preemie, and my wife had uh, like twenty one days in the hospital. No, sorry, uh, two weeks in the in the hospital. My daughter had three weeks in the hospital. So wow, um, it was my daughter was in the NICU for three weeks. So 
uh, there was enough trauma there. <laughs> yeah, right. No, it's a lot to. I'm telling you, it's a, it's a lot. Having kids is stressful. Forget the rest of it. Forget if it goes mm-hmm. if it goes right or wrong. It's it's still very stressful. Um, how do you enjoy? Well, that's not my question. How did you manage prior to looping? Okay, so diagnosed. I did MDI for a few months and then with it by July, I was diagnosed April by July, I was on a Medtronic pump. Okay. So, um, I was doing Medtronic pumping from my senior year and then all the way through college and then till about, um, I went to an Omnipod probably maybe eight years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe less. And then, um, I right about the time that we got married, um, that was 2009, I was trying the Medtronic CGM, you know, the old harpoon. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, it was terrible. Um, it was, um, it was such a deep insertion and it like almost always bled. I remember, uh, we were at our rehearsal dinner and I had an, an infected CGM site from that Medtronic harpoon. And, um, I had to like pull it out in the bathroom of the sp- the spaghetti factory that we were eating our rehearsal dinner at and like gushed blood all over the bathroom. Um, like it was, it was gnarly. And, uh, I was like, I couldn't wait to be done with that. And I was not wanting to try CGMs again after that, uh, until, um, so I stayed on my Medtronic pump for a while. And then my, my endocrinologist, the one that had diagnosed me with, um, with, um, Hashimoto's, he, um, he didn't retire, but he, he closed his practice because he came the medical, became the medical direct medical director of the hospital mm-hmm. or like the diabetes director of the hospital. They have like a diabetes center. So he was closing his practice to like focus on that administrative role. And then I was like, well, you know, it's fine. I'll just control my, I'll just see my local, my PCP for diabetes related stuff. And, and this is still doing, you know, poking my finger, hopefully four times a day and, um, managing with my pump and my, my control was just not good. It was like, um, mid sevens. If I was doing well, um, I think it went as high as the mid eights. I think one point I got up to the low nines. Um, it just wasn't good. And then um, finally, I was like, it was just wasn't really getting better with my doctor. And I was like, I'd like to see an endocrinologist again. That endocrinologist was my current new one. Um, and he, the first thing he's like, I want to get you on a Dexcom. And I was like, well, I tried this other Medtronic one. It was terrible. And he's like, Dexcom is way better. Try it. And I said, okay. And it was amazing. I have questions. And, hold on a second. Tim, hold, yeah. hold your thought there because I have a few questions. First of all, I just want to let people know uh, the old Spaghetti Factory does have open positions if you're looking for a job. Um, yeah, and if you want to clean up blood out of the bathroom from there people. There might still the be some there in, in one of them. <laughs> yeah, the one in Fullerton, California. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine people are like, oh, God, I go to that one. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> trust me. There's bound to be listeners to go to that one. I'm gonna say whatever happened to him in that bathroom is not nearly the worst thing that's ever happened in the spaghetti factory bathroom. Which, by the way, way to splurge on that on that meal. That's <laughs> <laughs> very nice. We kept our we kept our wedding under budget. Like we were. Oh, I can you know. tell when you said the old spaghetti factory. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we kept our wedding under ten grand, which is really hard to do. This meal might have um, been at least seventy five dollars. Yeah. <laughs> I've never been to a spaghetti factory. I don't mean to. Um, all I know is that if I try to eat at a place called the Cheesecake Factory, I don't know if it's any relation, I will become physically ill for many hours afterwards. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Mm. So so tell me first. You talked about your management. You said, uh, you know, if I'm lucky, I'm in the sevens. What did that mean? Because we're not talking about such a long time ago, right? Now, you're painting a picture around 2009. Is that right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, right around then. What weren't you doing that you could have been? Um, I mean, I wasn't poking my finger like before and after every meal. So I'd usually do it before, but usually not two hours after. So never have a real representation of like whether the insulin you gave yourself was working. Mm -hmm. Pre-bolusing wasn't a thing. Um, so, um, sorry, my microphone's like drifting down. It's on a little boom. (laughs) 
So I'm going <laughs> to adjust this. Hopefully it doesn't creak. Take your time. Was it in your vision? You could just see it dropping? Yeah. <laughs> So I, I bought, I invested when I started teaching from home, I invested in a really nice no, blue you, you sound terrific. microphone. Which one is it? Uh, it's a blue spark. Oh, it sounds great. It's like a Yeti, but it's actually a, um, an XLR cable microphone, not like a USB microphone. Oh yeah. I can't expect everybody to do that. Um, but good mics makes Scott happy. Okay, so were these things, were these besides the pre bolt? Well, you said pre bolting wasn't a thing because you didn't do it or because nobody told you about it? No one ever told me. I was always told to give myself my insulin when I eat. Um, and um, n- it was never emphasized that I should do it before. Okay. Um, and then, you know, at that point in my life, I was lucky to give it when I eat. Oftentimes I would eat and then be like, oh, shoot, I forgot. And then I'd give myself insulin. So you'd get insulin when your blood sugar was 200, maybe sometimes. Oh, easily. Yeah. Easily. But I mean, no CGM. So how would I know? But yeah. And you weren't testing later. So you would just, so you'd eat. So, okay. So maybe you would test and say, all right, my blood sugar is 150 and I'm about to have lunch. But then you'd mm-hmm. eat, take in, I mean, the spaghetti factory, we're going to call 170 carbs for your meal. That salad looks <laughs> like it has 40 carbs in it. And um, yeah. I yeah. love that in a restaurant. Yeah. They're like, it's a salad. I'm like, is it? And, um, and anyway, so you're, you're, you know, whatever your meal is, you eat, your blood sugar's going up from there. You bolus, but you never check in again to see what happens. Yeah. And it's still, and still you're in the sevens. Yeah. It's oddly, usually. it's oddly successful. Started creeping up a little bit, but yeah. A- okay. And so- then uh, and at this time too, it was, if I was making changes to my insulin, it was with when I was in the endocrinologist's office looking through my inadequate charts. Um, so, um, you know, we are still, at this point, you still have the log book. Yeah. Um, I was past the, I think when I was diagnosed in high school, I, I was listening to someone recently on the podcast who was talking about fudging numbers in your logbook when mm-hmm. you're a kid so that you don't get yelled at by your doctor. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I remember doing that. <laughs> what a lovely um, memory. Yeah. Uh, like, um, so um, you're like, oh, I just look at all these blank spots. Well, let's just write a, you know, 200 there and a 150 there or whatever. Make him feel good. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I was past that point. So yeah. I was, willing to own up to not checking my blood sugar enough. But um, yeah, once I got the CGM, that was helpful, but it still was like the the indicator of a bad job that I was doing. So you'd start to see like, oh yeah, I'm spending a lot of time spiking or I'm on a roller coaster or things like that. Yeah, it's a generational. So, it's, it's generational. For people who came up like you, getting a CGM did exactly that. It was like, oh, look how bad I am at this. Is, is how mm-hmm. is how it felt, right? Yeah, you know, absolutely. Which is, and and have you been able to get past that? Yes. Yeah. So, um, go back to I guess it was my daughter was a was a maybe three, um, before my son was born. Um, I was, I think I was on Omnipod at the time, but I still wasn't like like I wasn't looping and wasn't taking it all that seriously yet. Okay. So, um, when I was diagnosed back in high school, there was one, two other kids in my high school that had diabetes. Um, one of which really went out of his way to become close friends with me regarding diabetes and be diabetic buddies. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was a guy named Paul. He was an awesome guy. He was diagnosed at like age four. We both had Medtronic pumps we would always get together in the morning and be like, oh, I was changing my pump site this morning and, you know, splurted blood all over the place. Like it was like, we would share stories with each other and right. we were good friends. And fast forward, like, you know, I'm in California, he's up in Washington, but then I heard that he died. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't really know the reason, but I, I guessing that it had something to do with diabetes. And uh, also I had had a, an eye test recently um, where they said that there was a lesion in my eye. Okay. Um, and so those two things together were the, um, the holy crap, let's get this, let's get my act together. Right. Um, my daughter was maybe three and it was, I was like, I just, no, we got to get this together. So um, I, at that point, I was like, I'm going to do whatever I need to do to get my diabetes under control. Um, there was a, friend of mine at church who uh his sister was type one and a nurse 
and she was a big proponent of low carb. So, um, of ketogenic Mm -hmm. eating. And so that was my first thing was like, okay, well, I'm going to change the way that I'm eating so that I can make this easier and have better control. So, um, I committed to eat that way for a year and I started eating low carb and, um, my A1C dropped below the sevens. So it was like 6.1, 6.4 at the highest, um, pretty straight lines. And, um, but what I noticed eating that way was this is probably like 2018 that, that, um, I was doing this, um, insulin resistance became a real issue. So if I was going up either from, you know, your body, you know, releasing hormones or whatever, um, or a small amount of carbs that you take in, uh, it seemed like no normal amount of insulin would bring it down. Uh, and no, even no increased amount of insulin will bring it down. It would just be stuck. And until you'd stacked all this insulin on it and came crashing down. Right. So, um, that insulin resistance part of it was like really a big deal. Also, like uh, at that point in my life, I was uh, starting to like gain a lot of weight, mm-hmm. um, partially cause I was kind of eating, <laughs> I was eating like I was a 20 year old when I wasn't anymore. Right. Um, and partially cause, um, I think I was having this insulin resistance issue. My doctor actually put me on metformin, mm-hmm. um, saying that, like, you know, you're having insulin resistance. Let's give you metformin, see how it helps. It helped me lose a little bit of weight. It lowered my insulin needs by about a third. Um, and then, um, then I went low carb. And I ended up not needing the metformin anymore, and I lost a whole bunch of weight. Like I went down, like to a much healthier weight. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm like five, nine and I weighed, I think at the most, I was like two fifteen, okay. And then, um, at this point I went down to like the one eighties and then, um, the so the insulin, after a year of eating that way, I was just finding, I was like, okay, this insulin resistance thing is really like discouraging. And, uh, so I started looking up other things like other ways of eating or what you know, if there's other issues and, or what might be helpful. And I came across the mastering diabetes guys. Yeah. Um, and they they purport, purport a plant-based whole food, very low fat vegan diet. And their whole thing is we make this diet will make you super sin- insulin sensitive. And I was like, okay, that sounds like the solution to my problem. So I was like, I'll try that for a year or so. And I tried that. And then, um, I lost even more weight. I went down to like 175, which Hmm. is like the lowest I weighed since high school um, or college. Um, Did find when I was eating really consistently that way that I became really resistant to insulin. I was also exercising more, which helps. I think you misspoke. You were, you said resistant. Oh, I'm sorry. Sensitive. Sensitive. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I was becoming more sensitive to my insulin, less insulin resistant. Right. And I, um, I, I was uh, finding it really helpful. Um, but my family wasn't eating that way. It, and that made it kind of difficult. And I, um, and then the pandemic hit and, um, it was just a lot harder to, um, stay as, um, clean on it as I was, I was still eating that way, but I wasn't eating as clean. Like I was allowing more oils and, um, eating bread. Cause I started doing the home sourdough break- baking thing. <laughs> um, and, um, this is before my daughter had celiac, right? So, um, I, I was finding that it was being, it was less beneficial. And then, then I was like, I'm not sure if I want to keep up with this. And then that's about the same time that I really discovered your podcast. Okay. So, um, here I was like, like, Oh, the answer to diabetes control is in eating a certain way. And then, um, and that also I started looping about that time too. Mm -hmm. Um, and just set it up all on my own. Um, like without much guidance as to what my numbers needed to be. Um, and you know, looking at the loop and learn stuff online is helpful too, but, um, so I discovered your podcast was looking at all those different stuff about loop, about looping, which is really, really helpful. 
Um, I still don't feel like my numbers are completely as dialed in as they should be, but I working on that. I might pick your brain on that a little bit. Okay. Um, and, but really what I was like realizing is that I don't have to eat one of these ways. If I start doing other things, like if I start making sure my basil is really dialed in and pre bolusing, um, and revising the way that I, um, bolus for fat and protein, I think that I will have the results I'm looking for and be able to stop pretending that you like a Brussels sprout. Yeah. Yeah. Cause nobody likes actually Brussels. Scott, I, I don't mind Brussels sprouts, uh, but, yeah, um, but, but that's, that's, that's only if they're cooked in olive oil with balsamic vinegar. Tim, like, so, t- Tim, have you ever heard anybody say, I don't mind a chocolate chip cookie. No one's ever <laughs> said it that way. You know what I mean? <laughs> You're not wrong. Yeah. No one goes, Oh, Doritos. I don't mind them. <laughs> <laughs> those things are genetically engineered in the lab to i i be I, delicious i wish people understood that a dorito uh in 2022 doesn't taste like a dorito from 2019 doesn't taste like one from 2010 like it's fascinating how they've i'm assuming there's like less and less actual like food in them as they go along i don't know but whatever there some some mad genius works in those those labs making those chemicals so things taste the way they do it's it's really is fascinating but i listen i just don't like brussels sprouts but that's but but i but i'm taking your point which i think is that you found a number of different ways to help yourself and now yeah. it sounds like you use a blend of all of them i would say so yeah and i think that the the most significant thing is a lot of your advice on pre bolusing which again like i told you was like wasn't something that i was told to do um, but it makes so much sense. And when I actually implement it correctly, it works really well. And when I don't implement it correctly, I really notice a difference. It's all timing um, and amount, Tim. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. I, I, this is my favorite part of the podcast where people say nice stuff about me. So I didn't mean to talk over you just now. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I, I'm happy that it, it meant something. I hear people talking about those, uh, those vegetable boys sometimes, and um, I don't know their names, or and I've forgotten what you what you said already, what the name of it is. But um, tell me again, the yeah. So it's mastering diabetes. Mastering diabetes. Um, right. I think that what they say is uh, it can be beneficial. I, a lot of what they do is pointed toward type twos, mm-hmm. but those two guys are type ones themselves. Um, and um, but it it uses that coaching model which i feel like is unethical okay hold on a second so we'll um you can talk about that if you want what i was going to say first was it, you can't argue with it like pre bolusing is terrific understanding how insulin works is amazing but the truth of it is if you eat a brussels sprout instead of a dorito it's going to be easier on your body and easier on yeah. your body is going to mean less insulin etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah. i'm never you'll never hear me argue about that well uh, and here's yeah. the thing too about about their style of eating is that um they they would com- they completely ignore the whole aspect of fat and protein um, is going to have a different impact on your blood sugar that needs insulin in a different way. Okay, they just ignore that completely because it's irrelevant to their their style of eating. Because yeah, because so, it's not involved in what they're eating, right? Yeah, yeah. because um, you completely take out the fat and protein, only get protein from beans and the vegetables that you eat, mm-hmm. and um, and whole grains and stuff. And yes, that's very healthy. Um, I was. My blood work was the healthiest it's ever been when I was eating that way. It's really you know, astonishing, beneficial. I'd imagine. Sure. No, I would I, I would imagine that taking out extra things for your body to do makes it easier for your body to exist. But in mm-hmm. the end, Tim, it's how you look, right? I'm just kidding. But I was going to say, <laughs> you got to choose between. Uh, I just used to know this woman who used to say, you have to choose between your ass and your face. <laughs> I, <laughs> that was how she put eating. <laughs> she said, she goes, uh. She goes, if you, uh, is about, I guess she was talking about fat, basically. You know, you want your ass to look nice, or your face to look nice is how she used to say it. I don't know how accurate that is, <laughs> but I could just, I just picture this older woman wandering through my life going, you got to choose between your ass and your face. <laughs> like, okay. What's that expression? A, a moment on the lips, a lifetime on the hips. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's exactly what we're talking about. But apparently yeah. you get a nice youthful look in your face, little chump. Like, I, listen, I carry extra weight and I look 10 years younger than I am. If I was super thin, I'd look old. I saw Kevin Bacon the other day. He's probably a thousand times healthier than I am. And he looked 30 years older than me. So I don't know. He'll probably live yeah. until he's 120. Uh, but he looks like Methuselah. So what are we going to do? Methuselah, huh. that, that, that doesn't hit for you, right? 
You're not Jewish. No, I get it. Oh, he's okay. an old dude in the Bible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, exactly. Still, by the way, I'm going to call this episode, This Blows. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't said anything else that got me off it. So I don't want to talk about anybody specifically, but I do want to hear what you were going to say about coaching models and how that strikes you as a person with diabetes. Yeah. Um, so like their, their coaching model thing is like, um, you sign up, you pay way too much money a month and they have a coach that goes through your food journals and your blood sugar numbers and helps you make the right decisions and stay motivated and on their way of eating and stuff like that. And, um, they do put a lot of their information online, not needing that. Mm -hmm. And then they also have a book and their book is good. So if anyone wants to eat, eat that way and get the help. I think reading the book is fine. I don't mm. think that's unethical, but, but I think that kind of like gatekeeping diabetes management from a coaching model, something that can't be covered by insurance, you know, like is kind of bizarre. Yeah. And I, I was, I was never interested in that. I was like, I can figure this out myself. Like, uh, and I was having success with it without needing to coach with them, but. It's funny because to me, so I take your point, but I don't have diabetes, right? And so, but I am, I'm, listen, I've existed in this space for a very long time. I've, I've been very connected with people with type one and type two diabetes for a, a large portion of my adult life. I can't make right in my own heart safeguarding information like that. But I understand it from a business perspective. You have this thing. You need to sell it. If you don't sell it, you're going to be out of the business. We'll charge everybody an amount of money. This will keep us going. We'll make money. We'll exist. They'll get good information. But it still keeps some people from hear from hearing it. And I, to me, I just listen. I just figured out a way to do it where somebody else pays so you can hear. That's pretty. Yeah. That's pretty much it. And you know, would I have had I chosen, I guess if I wasn't who I am and had I chosen to, to put everything behind a, you know, a fence that you had to pay to get over. If I did that, not as many people would know the podcast. And to me, yeah. it's about reaching the most people, giving the most people an opportunity to have a healthy, happy existence. And I found a way to do that where I pay my bills and I reach a bunch of people and some people do it differently. I mean, I could, I know what my numbers are. If 10% of you had to pay me $100 a month to listen to this podcast, I'd be okay. Y you know what I mean? Um, I might actually be... Tim, hold on a second. Let me just do a little gazintas here with you real quick. Uh -huh. Times. Uh -huh. Yeah. Truth is, I'd be making a lot more money. Like a significant amount more. But... I just, I can't, I can't bring myself to do it. I don't even know if I see it as a moral thing. It just, I'm not wired that way, mm -hmm. but I could, I could clear a couple million dollars a year if I did that. So I, when I was like first deciding to go on to their style, their, their way of eating, mm -hmm. um, I was like trying to crunch the numbers on whether or not I wanted to do the coaching thing. And I was like, like, even if I wanted to, like, I, it would be too hard of a financial hit for my family to do that. Right. So, um, yeah, it's like, and I'm, you know, firmly middle class as a, I'm a teacher. My wife's a preschool teacher. Sure. So, um, yeah, I want to so be clear that just, I don't make anywhere near a million dollars a year. I just want to say that real quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I mean, I, what, well, yeah, what, I'm, I. what I'm trying to say is by, by mul by a magnitude of order, I would make yeah. more money if I, if I fucked over 90% of you and charged the other 10% that could afford it. Oh yeah. Make a note. Um, 59, point we just 59, 30. I got it. Don't worry. Thank yeah. you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just, and I, and I didn't have to say it that way, but it is what would end up happening. I yeah. would, I would just have to cut most of you away and say, sorry, you don't get to hear the podcast. And for the people who could remain and pay, you'd make me rich. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I'm not struggling, Tim. I don't want you to feel that way. You, you know, but it's uh, it's a decision, and I mean, it's hard to argue with. You, you'll yeah. you'll know I gave up at the end if I do it. It's gonna be like Scott's gonna cash in at the end. <laughs> the, the whole podcast just went behind a went behind a paywall. <laughs> He's given up. Um, but you know, I've been doing this for this is the eighth season of this. Is it? 
15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20. This is the eighth season of this show. Like the eighth, yeah. you know, not the eighth, like, you know, some crap podcast that has 10 episodes a year. And they're like, it's a season. I'm like, yeah, it's two weeks of your life. Like I, I make four episodes a week um, for years. And before that, I was one episode a week, two episodes a week. This podcast has over 700 episodes as we're, as we're doing this. Yeah. And I even see that as part of how I keep you all interested so more people can come in and learn about how to pre us and do the, the basic things that I don't think should be kept from you. So, you know, to me, this conversation with you today is as much about telling your story so that people who need community can feel community as it is about hopefully entertaining someone into thinking, why don't I go find out what those pro tip episodes are about? Y- yeah. You know, like I am, I am thoughtfully trying to help the people who are listening to the show and yeah. you know, it works or, you know, as well as it does, I'm about to hit, um, I would say in the next handful of days, the show's going to hit, I want to make sure I get the number right. In the next couple of days, the show's going to hit 7 million total downloads, keeping in mind that the first four or so years of it probably only had 2 million. So I've, I've stacked on like 5 million over the last handful of years. Uh, today, yeah. the podcast became this, this month, I think it's June. So it's June 29 right now. Uh, today, the, this, this day made this month the most popular po- month of the podcast ever. And if the next 30 hours go the way I think, I'm going to crest a significant download number for this month. And I see that and I just think, cool, let's do more. Let's find more yeah. people, teach them how to get their basil set up. Let's get more people who can decide, I want to control IQ. No, I want Omnipod 5. I'm going to, I'm going to wear a Medtronic. I'm going to use an insulin pen. I'm going to use a pump. I'm going to use a pen. I'm going to figure out what works for me. I'm going to eat low carb. I'm going to have, I'm going to eat vegetables. I'm going to pre bolus real consistently. Whatever you take out of this that helps you is what I want for you. That, that's, and I just, that's you know, I went through all these different ways of eating. Um, and I feel like if I had discovered your podcast first, I might have saved, although, you know, honestly, it was a good experience to have eaten that way. I don't regret it at all. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I'm better at cooking vegetables now than I ever was before. And so I can incorporate that into when I don't eat vegetables. But um, and I also try to eat more vegetables than I did before this whole thing. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's but if I'd had your podcast, I think back then I, it would have saved me a bit of grief as far as some of the diabetes education stuff that maybe I and maybe if I had seen a diabetes educator, I might have gotten that information. Some of it too is like when you have had diabetes for a certain number of years, you're like, you'll see an endocrinologist and they won't necessarily think you need to see a a diabetes educator, um, even though they might have stuff that's helpful. So Mm -hmm. like, I I don't think I saw a dietitian or a diabetes educator since I was first diagnosed. Yeah. Well, I mean, the truth is it sounds like your friend's death is what helped you the most, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. It's ironic. Do you think about that often? Um, yeah, I, I think about it from time to time. Mm-hmm. It's terrible. As you were explaining your story with him and you're talking about meeting him before school and commiserating in my, in the back of my head and the bottom of my heart, I'm like, Oh God, Paul's dead. Like, that's yeah. exactly what I was thinking when you were telling the story, uh, because you hadn't up until then mentioned the birth of your children is the reason why you fixed it, which is what a lot of people say. Yeah. So don't let your wife hear that part that the birth of your children didn't didn't move you <laughs> enough to take care of your dog. I definitely I definitely wanted to <laughs> fix it so that I could be around for my children. Was she not great, the kid? Is that what you're telling me? Is she just okay? <laughs> <laughs> she's fantastic. <laughs> she's she's wonderful. Um I'm Let's teasing. See. I'm sure she's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, she is a great kid. <laughs> Can you imagine if we got done recording and you were like it, it, really, the kid's a, she's an albatross. I have to tell you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Complains constantly, whines, can't read. It's terrible. <laughs> just fixing the reading thing right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. No, I'm yeah. just, I'm obviously, I'm teasing. Because at this point, your wife's like, why did we do this? <laughs> she's listening back. <laughs> but no, I mean, my, my point is, is that 
I mean, I've interviewed interviewed enough people, apparently not to be able to say interviewed, but I've interviewed enough people to know that it takes some sort of a life moment where you suddenly don't feel like you're the focus of, of the world. And, and, yeah. and you start thinking about other people more than you think about yourself. And then you realize, I can't die. That's exactly what it ends up being. I can't, I have to be here. Or I love this person so much, I can't, I don't want to shorten this time. And, and that's usually what gets people. And hopefully, it's before something happens to them that's irreversible. And, um, and speaking of that, how are your eyes doing since you're managing differently? Yeah. So, uh, first of all, since really looping, trying to pre bolus as much as I can, and I'm not always great at it, but I'm, you know, yeah. working on getting better. Um, my A1C, my last A1C was 5.5. That's amazing. And my last time I went to the eye doctor, they said that there's no sign of diabetic um, neuropathy in the eyes anymore. So that all resolved itself. So yeah. Wonderful. Good for you. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's excellent. That's excellent news. Um, One of the things I wanted to ask about. Yeah, go ahead. Let's do it. Your turn. Is um, loop, loop related. So, um, I feel like my my basal is borderline too aggressive. Um, but it's hard to say, and I'm, perhaps I just need to turn open loop off so I can really see, but um, I, I don't like doing that because I like open loop. I mean, uh, I like a closed loop, I mean. Right. Um, but like overnight, I'll have some nights where I'm sitting at you know, 65, like, which is too low, I know. Um, I want it to be higher. Um, but then other nights I climb into 150, maybe even 200 and then come crashing down. Mm-hmm. And um, I guess it's, I, I can usually look back and be like, okay, my dinner was like a little bit either carbier or high fat or whatever, Yeah. but not necessarily always. How about the Sometimes age of I the think pod? it might be. Pardon? Age of the pod. You ever notice on the third yeah. day? Maybe? No, my pods. I, and as I'm getting, I, I'm seeing my pods fail more consistently um, into the second day, which is frustrating, but it is what it is. And I have enough of them. My doctor writes a prescription so that I could change them every two if I wanted. Right. Um, but yeah, I think it is oftentimes either pods or like a carbier or um, fattier dinner. Well, I know what you I end up. Good. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I'll end up like what I, I was also kind of making adjustments to my ISF mm-hmm. in loop. Um, and I was, it was something that, um, uh, Mr. Fox was saying, um, that, um, <laughs> I haven't met him. We live in the same County, but I haven't met him. Yet. Do you really? Um, yeah. Um, I think we're Facebook friends, but, um, the, he was saying something about leaving your basal the same. And I used to have a bajillion basal rates like back when I had, you know, other ways of doing things, but I set it to one basal rate. And then I set my ISF to be, yeah, my sensitivity factor to be um, like more aggressive at like bedtime and less aggressive as the night went on. Mm -hmm. um, So that hopefully it wouldn't overpower me. And, but I'm still getting overpowered and waking up, having bad lows at night. Yeah. How, how low? Um, in the forties. Yeah. I had to stop a 60. So, um, huh. so Arden used the Omnipod five for a while. Tim, this is going to be something now that just you and I know. So when you get off of here, you're going to keep it to yourself because yours is not going to come out for a while and you'll ruin the timeline of my podcast. Um, you got it, buddy. okay. Thank you. But Arden used Omnipod five for a number of months got the real gist of it. I understand how it works and everything. And it's just, um, it's, it's really, um, listen, all these algorithms are amazing. And, um, but we went back to loop. So, um, Arden went back to loop, but she also stopped birth control at the same time. So I'm watching her insulin needs. They're starting to go down as the birth control pill leaves her and leaves her. So I'm having to, I don't want to over adjust yet. I'm trying to watch, but she had like a 55 last night at like three in the morning. And mm-hmm. I was thinking of doing the same thing that you were thinking of, which is to take away um, some insulin sensitivity to make it weaker in the 
the one thirty to three, four, five o'clock range overnight. I think that might help a little bit. Um, but for you specifically, what you're talking about, do you have night scout? Yeah. Yeah. So are you noticing, you said you think the basil might be too heavy. Are you noticing the algorithm taking away the basil all the time? I'm going to look and see. I haven't looked at my night scout recently. Because, I mean, there's a lot to think about, right? Like, you know, is this happening on the third day of a pod? Because if it is, then maybe that's got something to do with it. Uh, yeah. these, the higher blood sugars. But if you're getting lows while the thing's constantly taking away basil overnight, then maybe your basil's a little strong. Or maybe your insulin sensitivity is a little strong. Yeah. Or maybe they're both a little strong. I don't know. And the other thing, too, it's, it's a little bit hard to tell because um, I, I'll, I have, a, you know, I'll, uh, uh, one of Jenny's tips, mm -hmm. um, like a one point, uh, like a hundred fifty percent basal increase for eight hours. Start it after you finish your meal, your high fat meal. Mm -hmm. So I have that as a as an override. Um, and usually when I hit that, I don't have a big rise. So that's helpful. That's excellent. So, um, or if I have a rise, it won't be it won't be like over one fifty. So that's that's good too. But, um, yeah, it's. Um, Let's see. I'm looking at my night scout right now to see. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, opening the loop up and running it like a regular system for a little while and just seeing if you're getting what you want, because sometimes your settings do get out of whack. You, you know, I was talking to somebody earlier today and I said, I said the same thing. I'm like, I'd open the loop up and let it run for a little while. See how your meals go. See how your stability is away from, uh, boluses and food and see if your basil is really working or if you're being drugged down or drifting up because I think the person I was talking to earlier has probably found a way to compensate their basil being too high with their carb ratio being lower than it should mm -hmm. almost like old school MDI care where they kind of yeah. load, load you up on basil and then assumed you weren't going to bolus for your meal as well and that's where mine might be. Like my basal rate right now is, uh, I think I just marked it. I just brought it down a tiny bit, but it's, it was like 1.75. I, I think it's 1.65 right now. And you weigh, are you 170 right now? No, I'm a little bit more than that. I'm okay. Like 190. 190. Well, it's not crazy. Well, I mean, it's either, but, are, and are you still taking the metformin? No. Mm. And you're not eating the, 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 the fruits and vegetables anymore like that. Uh, not as much as much. Still try to eat. Well, maybe, yeah. maybe there's that a little bit there Tim. Maybe you gave up that diet and you gave up the metformin. Those were two things that were making your sensitivity greater. Mm -hmm. So now your basil's higher and then maybe there's times when it just, maybe your sensitivity's there for reasons we don't make, maybe it's exercise or something like that. And yeah. then, um, and now you're getting low. I mean, you've been married for a while. Would you have sex like once a month? Is it happening once hey. a month? Are you getting low once a month? <laughs> Depends. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to just pick out a good month. Uh, <laughs> but, you, but you know what I mean? Like maybe there's another impact coming in and increasing your sensitivity a little bit and making those lows for you. Or maybe yeah, you're having no. big and carby I, I, meals and crushing we're, them. We're trying to, like, we're trying to teach my daughter to swim and we're trying to get to the pool every day. So we can, so we're like, swimming a lot, um, trying to exercise, but I'm not like doing like weightlifting, which really helps. And I need to do it. Like exercise um, is going to help for sure. Any kind of yeah. consistent exercise. I, I'll tell you right now, if you want to know what's great about loop, um, over retail systems, any of them, it's a lower target and a more aggressive attack of a rising blood sugar. Yeah. That to me is what makes it special. And for all of these systems, what make them special is that all the stuff we just talked about, those variables, some of those knowable and then sometimes unknowable things, you can have this algorithm out ahead of you going, oh, God, here's more. Oh, here's less. Here's more. Here's less. Because without that, you turn into everybody else who's using insulin, who is feeding three lows a day or existing with a 250 blood sugar for five hours because they don't want to get low later or, mm -hmm. or the other problems. The problem is, is that this is a constantly fluctuating situation and you are not a computer, Tim. So, yeah. you know, you get your settings as good as you can get them. And you, I, I just expect that some days you're going to be 55 at three o'clock in the morning, but let's try to limit it as much as we can. 
And for people, well, and, um, of course, the good news is loop will then pull me back up again. So like, I'll be, you know, 80 by wake up time. If you, you don't know? make, if you don't make a significant mistake with insulin, the loop is very, very good at stopping you from at least having a, a really bad low blood sugar incident. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can still do it. You could bolus at the wrong time or have variables that you don't, you don't factor in. And um, and make some big bolus for something when you didn't need it. I mean, you can overpower that algorithm, but um, in a normal situation, it, I mean, nobody wants to be fifty. But you know, when you go back later and see how the you know the algorithm was taking away basil for two and a half hours and it caught you at fifty, you got to mm-hmm. think in that exact same sleeping situation, your blood sugar would be zero if it wasn't for that algorithm. So, yeah, absolutely. it's amazing. Absolutely no, I amazing. I never want to. I love. I love loop, man. I love it so much. Yeah. I, uh, are, are you, um, you guys are still using an orange link. We are using the orange link. Yes. Yeah. So, cause I know that they're, they're not far off from 3.0 coming out and being able to use dash pods, but like that's all the, the fancy computer people are working on that one right now. When we, um, switched from, uh, when, when he called, I called us med and I said, um, get, you know, I'm going to stop getting the Omnipod five. Now I want to get, uh, go back to a different pod. They said, we'll put you back to where you were. And I said, eh, can't you give me a dash? So, um, I've got Omnipod dash is coming to the house. Now we have a small stockpile of arrows pods that we're using up and then we'll, hopefully we can coincide when the loop algorithm is ready for, uh, for dash and then just move to that. Yeah, I was actually thinking because I, I have a big stockpile of arrows too. I had like <laughs> practically twelve boxes saved up. Use them up. So, um, pardon? Yeah, use them up. Keep going. Right? Yeah. So right. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to use them up. I haven't ordered new ones, and then I want to try to start ordering dash pods after right. that, so I can. Well, the the big you know concern of the day is is that the FDA is talking about. I'm actually going to spend some time tomorrow getting behind this online, try to move some people. This will be long gone by then, but. There's um, something going on at the FDA where they might, they're, it's an ex, they're trying to say, what are they trying to say? In it was cybersecurity. Cybersecurity and medical devices, quality systems, considerations and content of pre-market submissions. Except, I mean, I don't know what, I got my wife reading it to explain it to me yeah. right now. But, I, I did the same thing last night. I just yeah. saw them post about it on um, either Loop and Learn or on your um, Facebook group. And yeah. I went online and... Um, and did the form. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to try to put the power of the podcast behind this a little bit, get people to send some notes, um, so that they don't protect. And I'm making quotes, our CGM data in a way where you can't use it because I I mean, listen, I guarantee you that at some point in the future, retail systems will have a lower target and they'll be more aggressive and they'll be great. But in the meantime, and and by the way, too, I want I do really mean this, and I'm going to say it over and over again because I don't want to dissuade people. For most people, you wear Omnipod Five, Control IQ, something like that, you are going to have a significant increase in your health and happiness, like significant. For people who know how to pay, put their A one C in the fives, and who don't see a spike over one forty very often, it, it, those aren't going to do that for you. They're not meant to, and it's unfair to hold them up next to each other, to be perfectly honest. But we need, as people who, I said we, I don't have diabetes. People who have diabetes need for industry to be pressured into moving forward. Like, we don't want any of, listen, Omnipod buys ads from me forever. You guys get the podcast because of them. They're uh, beautiful to me. And Arden's been using Omnipod since she was four. It's it's amazing. I'm thrilled that company exists. But I don't want anybody resting on their laurels. Like, it, Omnipod 5 is terrific. Make it better. And to me, that's target and um, stopping spikes. That's yeah. it. That's it. I mean, I'd be more interested in using one of those products. Because I've... Well, the other thing too is I thought, well, maybe I'll try Omnipod Five too. But then I'm also like so wedded to my Apple products from looping and just from doing music stuff where Apple's superior. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, um, I, I don't want to use Omnipod Five until it is talking to on iPhones. a phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I I, Ar- I handed Arden that the PDM, and she goes, "Oh, uh, uh, what's this?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, like, I could totally see that conversation happen. Yeah, yeah. actually, <laughs> the first knowing. first time I gave it to her, she went, "No." And put it down on the table and walked away from it. 
<laughs> just from looking at, just from realizing it wasn't on her phone. Yeah. Not that the product's not good or anything like that. It just, it wasn't on her phone. And she went, uh, no, I don't even know if she said, uh, she just went no and put it down. Mm-hmm. And then I said, I, we're going to do this. We're going to do it for a while. We want to understand how it works and it might be great for you. And we're going to find out, y- you know, so and- is she comfortable? I know she's going to school in the fall, right? Yes. Far away from you. Right. So is, are you going to have a little lesson on how to rebuild a loop? Like I'm going to get her a used laptop, put X code on it and have it for nothing else and ship it down to her so that if it, when it happens, she knows how to rebuild, rebuild the app and the people online have made it. So now you basically click a link to rebuild the app. It's Oh, I know. Last time I rebuilt, I used that link and it was the easiest thing ever. People, if you don't know how to loop, it's so easy. The internet's amazing. Listen, and and I'm a a music teacher and I figured it out. (laughs) We're going to forever be grateful (laughs) for the people who who put these efforts in. And yeah. I know that it doesn't always coincide with what industry would wish was happening or what the FDA would wish was happening, but you have to take a big, long look at this. It's, it's magical. It's helping people. It's driving innovation and uh, mm-hmm. it's very necessary. And if you squelch it or hide it behind some cybersecurity bullshit, um, you're going to be doing people a disservice with their health. So. Yeah, I agree with you. And <laughs> sorry, I was just thinking, I, I love explaining to people like, oh, I I hacked my insulin pump. Like, you know, like I'll it makes me feel like I'm much uh I'm much more um uh more savvy than I really yeah, am. Yeah, I just give it yeah. I, I just I, I just say there's a guy in Russia named Ivan. He did it and we download it off the <laughs> internet. And people yeah. do look at you a little sideways, but listen, I'll tell you right now, as far as um tight tolerances are concerned. It, it's I don't know who the hell Ivan is, man, but God bless, you know. Thanks, amazing. Ivan. Yeah, thank you very much. And everybody man, else that's involved. I'm, Duh. There's way more other people than Ivan. He's just the name I that sticks in my head, you know. But um, I mean, so many names run through my head about about people who've been putting incredible amounts of effort into this for years and years and years for you know largely no no thanks and no money and yeah. Um, and it's sometimes less deal. than thanks. I think I'm think about like, you know, like what a taxing thing it must have been for people like Katie. Of course. Um putting it together and then having people complain. And she's done such an amazing job yeah. <laughs> getting it readable and all that. You know, when people are complaining to you and you're like, uh you, all, all I can think is uh, you could have just said thank you. That would have been enough. <laughs> I yeah. Need to need to tell me what I've done wrong here as I'm spending mass amounts of my life for free explaining things to you. Uh, yeah, I, I would imagine people in her situation uh, have probably felt, uh, I mean, buoyed by it. I, and at times I would imagine it was frustrating. So, but it's yeah. it's incredibly, um, I'm incredibly grateful for it, as I'm sure everyone else is that uses it. And uh, everyone else should be too. If you're using Omnipod 5 or Control IQ or Medtronic's thing, like whatever you're using, like there are people out in the world driving innovation for you don't you don't even know there's even the um there used to be this little group i don't even know if they exist anymore they used to hammer the fda over stuff and even now that we're seeing exponential growth in diabetes products is because of like a small group like this little small nonprofit that just wouldn't let the fda up off the mat you know they just kept pushing them about stuff and um that's something you know you get di- diagnosed today you're never going to know that happened so yeah Anyway, all right, Tim, I kept you longer than I said. I'm, I'm assuming one of your kids is at a bus stop right now crying because they think you don't love them. And, <laughs> no, I, uh, I'm i teaching at a, a, a summer camp, um, but I like have had this on my books. for. So I told the, the director, like, oh, I need to have this morning off so I can do this thing. It's very nice. And, um, and so like, but I told him I'd be there at a certain time. So I should get over there. I'm starting soon. to think you got to go. Yeah, uh, unless you want to say anything nice about me, but then otherwise we can just say goodbye. <laughs> Uh, something nice about Scott. Um, I'll just say this, um, as much as I get a lot out of this podcast for management things, I get just as much, um, therapy and camaraderie. And, um, I just love hearing everyone's stories and I learned so much from everybody. So, um, I, I wanted to come on and kind of talk a little bit about my story. Not that it's particularly unique, but I feel like I have kind of a, a mix of a lot of the different things that people have talked about. Yeah. No, I appreciate it. I, I thought you were terrific. And you could tell that you listened. You rolled with it so well. So I appreciate it very much. <laughs> yeah, I listen uh, 
I listen a lot. My daughter's like, do we have to listen to this in the car? I'm like, fine, we'll put on Encanto. What's her um, name? Wait, what's her name? We're, we're not going to say na- it, right? <laughs> her No, uh, her name's Ruby. Oh, Ruby? Ruby, yeah. R- Ruby, don't tell your dad to shut my podcast off. I need these downloads, kid. I know you don't understand. You're little, but <laughs> this is what keeps the lights on, kid. Okay, and listen to the end, too. Please. All the way to the end. Yeah, there's ads at the end. And there's good stuff at the end. Sometimes you have the best jokes at the end. Well, the secret there, Tim, is that I sometimes record those very late at night, and I am very, very unaware of myself and don't care and too lazy to go back and edit. And I'll start rambling and saying stupid crap. And there's times my wife's like, what did you say at the end of that episode the other night? I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then she'll go back and play it for me, and I think, yeah, yeah I probably shouldn't have left that in there. <laughs> but what <laughs> do you you always do. I was making an ad last night. And I got five or six words into a sentence, and I thought, there's not one valuable word in that sentence. And I just said, I don't care. And I just kept rolling. I just kept rolling. I was like, I'm not stopping. Um, anyway, I appreciate that you like it. I'll tell you, one of the greatest things for me um, is that somehow my diabetes podcast is entertaining to people. Like, I mm, really. Yeah. I, Who knew, I, right? I, well, not me. I thought I was going you, to pump a bunch. Dude's not even a diabetic. <laughs> <laughs> let's not remind people all the time. Probably it's hard to listen to if you, if you realize that. But there was a time where I just thought, like, I'm going to do a information dump out of my head. And this yeah. won't last that long. And it'll just sit around like a repository. And when um, I yeah. when I first started listening, I um, I was like, wait, I, I didn't know the full story. And I was like, wait, is he diabetic? Or, oh, he's got a kid that's diabetic. Oh, interesting. This guy knows a lot. It's you cool. know? Well, it's cool that you um, gave him a chance. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I have other type one friends that I'm like, dude, check this out. Cause I know I have other type one friends that don't even use a Dexcom. And I'm like, right, come on. Mm. I hear sometimes <laughs> from type ones that are like trying to get adult friends to listen and their friends will be like, I'm not going to listen to somebody who doesn't have diabetes about diabetes. And like some people will write me notes and explain like, you know, my buddy's got like a nine and a half a one C and I was like, geez, forget diabetes. Like most people apparently know more about diabetes than you do. Like, just listen to anybody who would tell you, like, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe just, you know, I don't know, eat a certain way or do this or pre-bullet, whatever. Like, little adjustments can make a big deal. I don't understand it, and I do understand it. Like, I don't understand, like, why do you care where good information comes from? But I do understand I've been, you know, burdened by this my whole life and now you're telling me some guy who doesn't even have it is going to show up in my ears and explain this to me and he's going to understand it better than me like i can get where that would piss you off you know so yeah it, it does make sense in in certain situations but uh, i'm so delightful you would think you would just listen for the fun of it yeah put up an episode yesterday with a girl who drank out of her christmas tree where are you getting that you think the ada is telling you that story no <laughs> way baby that that one and the young the young woman whose butt exploded. Those are the. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you what. Missing. If the JDRF ever puts out any content where some girl's butt explodes, I give up. <laughs> but for now, this is the only place you're going to get it. And yes. by the way, I had somebody tell me recently like that had nothing to do with diabetes. And I was like, mm, you're wrong, because it has to do with wound care and high blood sugars. And it, it will. Someone will hear that story and think, oh, I had a sore here, or I cut myself and it didn't heal, or something like that. And it will connect the it'll it'll wire a circuit in their head for them, y- yeah. y- you know what I mean. And you can only do that with interesting content. Like you can't just like, you know. Listen, if I was the ADA, I think they have a podcast, but God knows it doesn't show up on the charts. So anyway, um, I'm, I'm just, <laughs> that's for sure. Let me just I, I've couple, never listened to it. Let me just be shitty about people trying to help people for a <laughs> second. <Tim. laughs> um, but you know, like if they come along and they start talking, they want to do 15 minutes on wound care. Uh, You're not going to listen to that because boring and you you know what I mean? Like uh, too much content in the world. I'm going to go watch a YouTube video before I listen to that. I'm going to go watch, uh, uh, you know, uh, my favorite television show for the 17th time before I do that. I, 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 I give you a podcast episode with a title, butthole adjacent. Anybody who sees that and doesn't think, what is this about? I don't understand you. You know what I mean? So you jump on, you start listening. This girl tells an intriguing story about her diagnosis that ends with her taint exploding and just yeah. like, come on, you're welcome. Yeah. Just Tim, that's again, better just say than thank getting you. it from Florida. <laughs> <laughs> just say thank you when I do that for you. Don't complain. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> My God. Anyway, all right, you're delightful. I appreciate this very much. I appreciate you too. Thank you, Scott.
A huge thank you to one of today's sponsors, Gvoke Glucagon. Find out more about Gvoke Hypopen at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. You spell that G V O K E G L U C A G O N dot com forward slash juice box. Thank you also to the Contour Next One blood glucose meter. I'm not kidding, it's a fantastic meter. Contour Next dot com forward slash juice box links in the show notes of the podcast player you're listening in now and links at juiceboxpodcast.com to gvoke contour and all the sponsors when you click on my links you're supporting the juice box podcast and speaking of the juice box podcast we have a private facebook group i think it has like thirty four thousand members in it right now and it is worth your time absolutely free juice box podcast type 1 diabetes on facebook That's about all I got for you today. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juicebox Podcast.